once again, Christian greetings to all our valued listeners and viewers throughout the whole world, more particularly to all shepherds, rod believers, and most especially to our beloved brothers and sisters in the United States of America. Good evening, and may the good Lord bless you, brothers and sisters. This is episode number 15 on our subject entitled, Where is the Hope of the World? Now, I would like to begin this episode reading 1SR, page 135. It says, These 13 chapters of Isaiah are one continuous letter written for the church. Though they have been in the Bible for many centuries, they were intended for us at this present time and stand as a direct epistle to the church now. The 54th chapter is the beginning of the letter and it ends with the 66 chapter. Now here the shepherd's rod plainly telling us that the last 13 chapters in the book of Isaiah is written particularly to the church in the last days or beginning in 1844 and it says that it is a continuous letter written for the church. Therefore, we can immediately discern that each chapter, beginning from chapter 54 up to chapter 66, the focal point is the church, according to this reading. Now, I would like to connect 1SR page 150. It says, A Redeemer promised to a penitent people. Now, I would like to read the portion saying, verse 16, first part. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. God was astonished. Moses and Aaron stood between the dead and the living. Number 16, verse 48. God used Elijah on Mount Carmel, First Kings chapter 18. In the crisis her brought to view, God finds no man. Ezekiel 22 verse 30. So he himself interposes. 1 as our page 150. Now, let us study closely. When does the perfect fulfillment of verse 16 must be applied? By which in that verse, the shepherd's rod plainly telling us that in the crisis her brought to view, God finds no man. Now let us read Ezekiel 22 and verse 30. It says, And I would like to begin on verse 28, 29, and 30. And her prophets have dubbed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord had not spoken. Verse 29. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompense upon their heads, saith the Lord God. Ezekiel 22, verse 28, 29, 30, and 31. Now here's another reading in 4 BC uh, Bible commentary on page 311. It says, verse 16, Isaiah 59. There was no man in the crisis that had risen, there was none able to provide relief. And the same, it says, see Ezekiel 22, verse 30. The same with 1SR 150. There was none to stay the threatened scourge, as did Aaron and Moses, number 16, verse 47 and 48. Or Peninas, numbers 25, verse 7 and 8. From a human point of view, the situation appeared hopeless. Help must come from God, as it did in Egypt at the Red Sea, and repeatedly throughout the wilderness wanderings and the occupation of the promised land. God would work for His own name's sake and for the sake of His striking people. 4 BC is the Bible commentary, page 311. Now, I would like to quote just a short sentence in Christ's object lesson, 302. It says, let's read the statement. In this crisis, I would like to read the upper part. In this thy day, the day is nearing its close. 
The period of mercy and privilege is well nigh ended. The clouds of vengeance are gathering. The rejectors of God's grace are about to be involved in swift and irretrievable ruin. Yet the world is asleep. The people know not the time of their visitation. In this crisis, where is the church to be found? Are its members meeting the claims of God? Are they fulfilling His commission in representing His character to the world? Are they urging upon the attention of their fellow men the last merciful message of warning? Crimes of Jack Lesson, page 302. Volume 9, in Testimonies for the Church, on page 28. Testimonies for the Church, volume 9, on page 28, and also in volume 6. And it says, And impressive sin, in the visions of the night, a very impressive sin passed before me. I saw an immense ball of fire fall among some beautiful mansions, causing their instant destruction. I heard someone say, We knew that the judgment of God were coming upon the earth, but we did not know that they would come so soon. Others with agonized voices said, You knew. Why then did you not tell us? We did not know. On every side, I heard similar words of reproach spoken. In this vision, we can easily discern that these people, according to their testimony, they have the knowledge that the judgment of God will be poured out. But the only thing that they did not know is that it would come so soon. They had been surprised because logically, they thought that God's judgment will still be in the far distant future. Now, here's another statement that I would like to read. Track number 2 on page 19. Do not, my brethren, say, the vision that he seeth is for many days to come. And he prophesied of the times that are far off. For the days are at hand and the effect of every vision. For Zion's sake, will I not hold my peace, says the Lord. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamb that burneth. Isaiah 62 verse 1. But I would like to emphasize the statement warning us saying, Do not my brethren say. Because this statement is pointing to the people according to the vision of the prophet in volume 9 page 28. That even though they knew that there are judgment that coming from the almighty God. They knew it. But the only thing that they did not know that such judgment will be poured out so soon. Or in other words, it is earlier than what they had expected. And they had been caught by surprise. And I think that is also corroborating to the statement given by Apostle Paul that while they will declare peace, peace, sudden destructions will overtake them. I would like to read the Great Controversy, page 371. Paul speaks of a class to whom the Lord's appearing will come unawares. The day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, and they shall not escape. But he adds to those who have given heed to the Savior's warning, Ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2 to 5. Now, here's another statement in 13 Symbolic Code 11 to 12, page 10. It says, Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Isaiah 13, verse 6. And if you will read 12 Symbolic Code number 1, it says here in page 13, this same verse that had been quoted, Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. It says, The day of the Lord is at hand, and the Lord is telling you and me to howl even now because of it. People can know only what they are told. Therefore, the command comes to howl, for certain destruction is coming. It is at hand. 12 Symbolic Code, number 1, page 13. Now, let us go back to our subject concerning 
Isaiah 59, verse 16. Reading Testimonies for the Church, volume 1, 355. Although on the record in folio, Isaiah 59 was omitted. Now, I would like to read Testimonies for the Church, volume 1, page 355 and 356. I saw that God is purifying and proving His people. He will refine them as gold until the dross is consumed and His image is reflected in them. All have not that spirit of self-denial and that willingness to endure hardness and to suffer for the truth's sake which God requires. Their wills are not subdued. They have not consecrated themselves wholly to God, seeking no greater pleasure than to do His will. Ministers and people lack spirituality and true godliness. Everything is to be shaken that can be shaken. God's people will be brought into most trying positions and all must be settled, rooted, and grounded in the truth or their steps will surely slide. If God comforts and nourishes the soul with His inspiring presence, they can endure through the way may be, though the way may be dark and thorny. For the darkness will soon pass away, and the true light shine forever. And then it says, I was pointed to Isaiah 58, Isaiah 59 verse 1 to 15, and Jeremiah 14 verse 10 to 12, as a description of the present state of our nation. The people of this nation have forsaken and forgotten God. They have chosen other gods and followed their own corrupt ways until God has turned from them. The inhabitants of the earth have trampled upon the law of God and broken His everlasting covenant. Now, what country mentioned here? And to repeat, it was omitted Isaiah 59. Because here in the original manuscript, Isaiah 58 is whole chapter. But Isaiah 59 is only from verse 1 to 15. But if you look at it, says Isaiah 58 verse 1 to 15. No, Isaiah 58 is the whole chapter. And then Isaiah 59 verse 1 to 15. And then Jeremiah 14, verse 10 to 12. And the prophet says that these verses is pointing to the United States of America by saying the people of this nation. What nation? In the preceding statement, it says, as a description of the present state of our nation. And that statement, our nation, is pointing to the United States of America. Brothers and sisters, in 1SR150, I would like to read again 1SR150, a Redeemer promise to a penitent people, Isaiah 59. Verses 2 to 8 tell how terrible and grievous our sins are in God's sight. The first verse contains the wonderful promise. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. If we would repent of our sins and turn to him with fasting and prayer, he will have mercy upon us and will hear our prayers. Though our sins are unspeakably great, verses 9 to 13 are of good report. Some of the people are conscious and repenting from their sins. From their sins. Some of the people are conscious and repenting from their sins. In verse 16 to 19 is a prophecy too sad to speak of. Thank you thoroughly, it says. Isaiah 59, verse 16 to verse 19 is a prophecy too sad to speak of. It applies to those upon whom the responsibility rested to bring about reformation by presenting the lessons to the church in their true light, calling every sin by its right name instead of applying it to other people and times and thereby diverting the instructions intended for the church. The admonitions in the scriptures were overlooked and unheeded, and what God expected of His people during the first three months of 1929 was not accomplished, simply because those in responsible positions failed to discharge their duty. But, brothers and sisters, think it thoroughly. The prophecy recorded in verse 16, 17, 18, and 19. Thus, these prophetic verses had been fulfilled completely in the days of Beatty Hotel. Now, the Spur prophecy says that these prophetic verses is pointing to the United States of America. That is very plain here in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, 355, that it is a description of the present state of our nation. And that is United States of America. And then says, the people of this nation have forsaken and forgotten God. 
They have chosen other gods and followed their own corrupt ways until God has turned from them. Now, when does the period of time by which this predicted event that God turned away from the United States of America? Think it thoroughly, brothers and sisters. Now, let us go back again to our subject concerning Revelation 14 verse 8. We already proven with absolute fact that Zechariah chapter 6 verse 8 is connected to Revelation 14 verse 8. Now, I would like to read the statement here. It says, page 29 and page 30 on track number 2. The concluding revelation is, Behold this that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. Zechariah chapter 6 verse 8. After the warning message by the Millerite movement had been rejected by the churches in fulfillment of the words, have quieted my spirit in the north country, God withdrew his spirit from them. In evidence of this, the second angel announced Babylon is fallen. Revelation 14 verse 8. Now the statement God withdrew his spirit from them can be easily understood that prior to 1844, God deposited His Spirit from these churches. For it is illogical to withdraw if there is nothing had been deposited. And that statement is also the same with the statement in 2SR page 97. The second angel's message, 2SR page 97, the second angel's message of Revelation 14 verse 8 had announced that Babylon, the churches prior to 1844, had fallen. That is to say that God would let no light shine upon His word through these fallen churches. In 2SR page 288, it says, the statement given by the voice of inspiration says, The question may arise with some, how can I determine what is inspired and what is not? The prophetic word of God is capable of answering the question and clearing the confusion, dividing the one from the other, as wheat is separated from the chaff. First to the law and the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them, uninspired. Isaiah 8 verse 20. Second, the churches who were in existence prior to 1844 fell with the proclamation of the second angel's message, Revelation 14 verse 8, showing that God would no longer reveal himself through that channel. 2SR 288. So that statement that God would no longer reveal himself through that channel, plainly indicating that prior to 1844, God is revealing himself through these channels. So the light from heaven is channeled to these movements. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we can easily understand that in the primary application of Revelation 14.8, because according to the reading in Great Controversy 390, that the perfect fulfillment of Revelation 14 verse 8 is still future. And it is closely connected to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And since the shepherd's rod attached Revelation 14 verse 8 to Zechariah chapter 6 verse 8, accordingly, the reason that God no longer revealed any light from these movements, God withdrew His Spirit from these people, brothers and sisters, because they rejected the message. And where is the North Country? Brothers and sisters, it, it points out to Babylon. According to track number 2, page 28, I would like to read, thus identifying Babylon as the north country. But the shepherd's rod made it so plain that there are two Babylons. In 2SR 245, it says, Thus the second angel's message of Revelation 14 verse 8 was proclaimed immediately after the disappointment, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That is, the word in 1844 fell in the same manner as the one before the flood. What is the Babylon before the flood? That is the antediluvian world. So what world that had been fallen in 1844? The antitypical antediluvian world, and that is the old world. The continent in Europe. As a matter of fact, the churches that God raised up during that time, it was in Europe, in the continent of Europe. Therefore, before 1844, brothers and sisters, the messages that God had sent, it was channeled through these churches, Lutherans, Presbyterian, Methodists, and Baptists. But look at the divine pattern. What message that Lutherans, Presbyterian, Methodists, and Baptists that they rejected. The message of William Miller. And that is from another continent. That is in the continent of, or western continent, from the United States of America. 
So let us read again, brothers and sisters, in track number 2, page 29. The concluding revelation is, Behold that this that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. Sikariah 6 verse 8. After the warning message by Millerite movement had been rejected, rejected by the churches. After the warning message by the Millerite movement had been rejected by the churches in fulfillment of the words, have quieted my spirit in the north country. God withdraws his spirit from them. Why is it that God withdraws his spirit from them? Because they rejected the message of William Miller. And for sure that is pointing to the black horses, the second chariot. Therefore, brothers and sisters, or in other words, if the message of William Miller had been accepted either by Lutherans, Presbyterian, Methodists, and Baptists, brothers and sisters, there might be possibility that the pronouncement in 1844 will not be proclaimed. But it was proclaimed in 1844. Now look at the statement. After such proclamation had been declared in 1844. Let us go back to 2SR 288. It says here, Second, the churches who were in existence prior to 1844 fell with the proclamation of the second angel's message, Revelation 14 verse 8, showing that God will no longer reveal himself through that channel. Therefore, every theory and offshoot or sect that has sprung from the denomination in existence at that time is false with no light in them. This is also proven by the fact that nearly all the authors of the founders of these theories and movements make no claim of inspiration. Look at the situation prior to 1844. The Lutherans, they claim that there is an inspired servant among them, and that is Martin Luther, Presbyterian, John Knox, Methodist, Wesley, Baptist, Campbell. But in 1844, all of these four great denominations, they no longer claim that there is an inspired servant of God among them. And that is why B.T. Hotep says, The question may arise with some, how can I determine what is inspired and what is not? The prophetic word of God is capable of answering the question and clearing the confusion, dividing the one from the other as wheat is separated from the chaff. First, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them, meaning uninspired, or meaning these four great denominations in 1844, there was no inspired servant among them. And the voice of inspiration says, do not expect any light. Because the truth and the light is only channeled by God through inspiration. I remember the statement in 2 TG 24. It says here in 2 TG number 24 on page 21. We have now already seen that the scriptures are not of private interpretation. And that Christendom as a whole has no inspired divinely appointed interpreter does not even claim to have one, and that the people are as confused as were the foolish Babel Tower builders when their language was replaced with diversified languages. 2 TJ 24-21. Now, that is the type, brothers and sisters, that prior to 1844, these movements had been founded by inspiration. God-inspired servant. But the significance in 1844 when God proclaimed the message of the second angel, it says that showing that God would no longer reveal himself through that channel. Or in other words, the statement, brothers and sisters, in 2SR page 97, going back again to 2SR page 97, saying that the second angel's message of Revelation 14 verse 8 had announced that Babylon, the churches prior to 1844, had fallen. But to elaborate this statement, to make it more clearer, it can be easily understood that the churches, which is of God, prior to the announcement of the second angel's message, brothers and sisters, the light from heaven, the messages that come from God, was channeled in these movements. And what is the other significance of such proclamation of Revelation 14 verse 8? It's easy to understand. If you will even read the entire page of 2SR page 97, indicating, brothers and sisters, that these movements, the purpose that God raised up this movement because it is His intention that the deadly one will be continually inflicted on the little horn head. 
It says here in 2SR page 97, By the divinely called movement, unaided by the writings of the spur prophecy, God's intention was to keep the deadly one on the head. That is the statement. So what is the significance of the proclamation of the message in 1844? It is to be understood that those movements that had been raised by God, by which the divine intention is to keep the deadly one on the head to be continually inflicted, are no longer performing their task, but rather they were helping the devil so that the deadly one on the little horn head will be healed. Instead of performing the task given by God to them, they were helping the devil. Now remember, in 1SR 216, I would like to read this statement. 1SR 216, But if Protestantism should depart from their pledge, the Bible and the Bible only, or refuse new light, the wound would be healed and the world would wander after the beast apostasy. After such divinely called movement will refuse to accept new light. That is the sign that they are already conquered by the devil and instead of inflicting the wound, they were helping the devil to heal the wound. The spiritual side and the material side. The spiritual side is that at the time when the church is no longer susceptible to accept new light, it indicates that that church had been defeated by the devil. I remember the statement in the old symbolic. Let me read to you this statement. In the old symbolic code, two symbolic code, number two, page 10. Two symbolic code, number two, page 10. It says, there is nothing in God's creation that stands still. Everything is doing something all the time. And whatever stops moving, he takes it away. If the heart stops beating, he takes away the life. And the substance of the body goes back to play. If a tree quits growing, it dies. Water that stands still gets stagnant. And in Acts of the Apostles 352, stagnant water is very dangerous. God's handiwork is not only ceaselessly moving on its own course, but it neither falls behind nor goes ahead. It forever keeps perfect time. If an airplane stops flying, it falls to the ground. When an automobile quits running, it becomes worthless to its owner. Anything that falls short of its set standard by its maker does not only become worthless, but also a nonsense. Now, this is an illustration in 2 Symbolic Code number 2, page 10. What keep the deadly wound? Or first of all, what delivered deadly blow to the little horn head? For sure, the answer is the sword of the Spirit. It is the sword of the Spirit. And that is particularly pointing to the new light, the present truth. And in Ezekiel chapter 4, the present truth there is illustrated by seven steps. Brothers and sisters, there are seven steps. And the very first one is the message delivered by Martin Luther, which delivered a deadly blow to the papacy. Volume 1, 374, and 2SR page 96. But after Martin Luther died, the movement is no longer continuing the task committed to them. Immediately, they have been defeated by the devil. Therefore, it necessitates for God to raise up another movement, and that is the Presbyterian, represented by Pergamos. But when Knox died, the movement stands still. Therefore, God raised up another movement, the Methodist. The same with Wesley. When Wesley died, the, the movement became standstill. Then God raised up the Baptist, brothers and sisters. That is Alexander Campbell. And then God raised up William Miller. But what happened to the message of William Miller? It had been rejected by the Lutherans, Presbyterian, Methodists, and Baptists. Plainly telling us that although these churches had been the channel of revelation from the messages coming from heaven, brothers and sisters, but at that time, that statement that we read into symbolic code number 2, page 10, it is not only worthless. That movement is not only worthless, but become nuisance to its maker. Because it fails. The statement used in answer error number one. I would like to read that statement. On page 70, it says, And what is still more basic and more urgently to the point is that its movement alike failed to progress from one message to the next and to go on to reach its final goal of transcendental attainments in its divine knowledge. Instead, it fell from the heights of its own early rich experience back down 
to spiritual poverty because it failed to keep pace with the truth. Its divinely called movement came to a standstill where it contentedly satisfied itself that is that it was yet in the sanctified steps to the mount of perfection that it was flourishing and that peace and spiritual prosperity were in all its borders when in reality quite the opposite was the truth answerer number one page 70 or in other words the proclamation of the second angel's message on its primary page on 1844 those movements that had been raised during the dark ages prior to 1844 lutherans presbyterian methodists and baptists It became worthless and not only worthless to its maker, which is the Almighty God, but it is also a nuisance because instead of allowing themselves to be an instrument of God, to let the deadly one on the little horn head on the nondescript beast be continually inflected, they were rather helping the devil to heal the wound. And therefore, the only way is to proclaim that these movements are rejected by God. Think it thoroughly, brothers and sisters. But the voice of inspiration says, that is only the partial fulfillment of Revelation 14 verse 8. The perfect fulfillment is still future. Now what does it mean? Revelation 14 verse 8. According to track number 2, page 29 and page 30, God withdrew His Spirit from them. Where? In the North Country. What is the North Country? Babylon. What Babylon by which God's Spirit withdrew? The antitypical, antidiluvian world. Because according to 2SR 245, there are two Babylons. The Babylon before the flood and the Babylon after the flood. Brothers and sisters, what is the world from 1844 onwards? That is the Babylon after the flood. Because every Davidian knew that the Babylon before the flood, the messenger is Enoch. But the Babylon, brothers and sisters, although we knew that Noah is also a preacher before the flood. Or in other words, as far as history is thus concerned, there are two prominent inspired messengers that God raised up before the flood. That is Enoch and Noah. But the voice of inspiration says that the, the Babylon that had fallen in 1844, according to 2SR 245, is the Babylon before the flood. Therefore, we can easily understand, brothers and sisters, that William Miller is typifying Enoch, and Sister White is typifying Noah. And it is Sister White that announced the fall of Babylon in 1844. What Babylon? The Babylon before the flood. But how about the Babylon after the flood? By which it is called the Tower of Babel. Now, brothers and sisters, in this study, we can easily discern that in reality, The focal point in the antitypical fulfillment is the final proclamation of Revelation 14, verse 8. Now, do not forget the statement in the Great Controversy 383, the message of the second angel announcing the fall of Babylon must apply to the religious bodies which were once pure and had become corrupt. What religious bodies that had been once pure and had become corrupt in 1844? That was Lutherans, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist. The Ephesus is not a part of the proclamation of the second angel's message in 1844. The early Christian church. Why? Because it was already fallen in 538. Or in other words, the production of Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 8 is pointing to the Ephesus, the early Christian church. And the production of Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 8. No, it is not included. The Lutherans, Presbyterian, Methodists, and Baptists. And that is why if you will read 2SR, it says here in 2SR page, let me read to you the statement. Given by the shepherd's rod. 2SR page 85. The leopard like beast. Revelation 13 verse 1 to 10. And reading the first paragraph. The nondescript beast of Daniel 7. Representing Rome in his first stage. Shows prophetically by his ten horns. That there were ten kings to arise out of Rome. In his second stage it is shown. That the papacy was to arise out of Rome. Subdue three kings and wear out the saints of the Mosai for the space of 1,260 years. But it tells not of the fall of the Roman monarchy or the papacy. You cannot see any light in the book of Daniel according to this reading. 
concerning the fall of the Roman monarchy and also the fall of the papacy. It is silent concerning the Reformation that came before or after 1798 AD. Therefore, the lack of information by the symbols of this beast must be found somewhere else in the prophetic word of God. This must be sought in the book of Revelation for it's the, it is the complement to Daniel's prophecies. And remember, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, let me read to you in the consecrated way to Christian perfection. Pages 96, 97, and 98. It says, I would like to read, I think in the upper portion, verse Advent Review, Sabbath Herald, 232, I think page 11. It says, No one, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. The title is Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Remember, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 is attached by Sister White in the fulfillment of Revelation 14 verse 8. And that is why we need to study closely, brothers and sisters, Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9 to verse 11. If possible, from verse 1 to verse 11. Because this is one of the reasons why Revelation 14 verse 8 is not perfectly or was not perfectly fulfilled in 1844 because the proclamation of Revelation 14 verse 8 in 1844 does not include 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In 538 AD, the epistles had fallen as the fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But it could not be the perfect fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 because Revelation 14, 8 was not proclaimed in 538 AD. The proclamation of the second angel's message in Revelation 14 verse 8, brothers and sisters, could not be the perfect fulfillment in 1844 because there was no fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. They must be joined together in its perfect fulfillment. What is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? The fulfillment of Daniel chapter 8. That the daily and the sanctuary will be trodden underfoot. Now think it thoroughly, brothers and sisters, because it is a wonderful prophecy. Let, let us view in the past. Why is it that the voice of inspiration says, no, that is not the perfect fulfillment of the prophecy? We need to understand the reasons. Why is it that it is not the perfect fulfillment of the prophecy? For example, 538 AD. Is it the perfect fulfillment of the prophecy of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? Then we need to jot down the high points, the important reasons. Why is it that we could declare clearly that the fulfillment in 538 AD is only partial fulfillment and could not be the perfect fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? Why? First, because 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is based on Daniel 8. Daniel chapter 8, brothers and sisters. That if you will apply Daniel chapter 8, or in other words, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is only an epistle of Apostle Paul as an explanation of Daniel chapter 8. Now, if you will apply Daniel chapter 8 during the dark ages of religion, how could it be? That in the perfect, if that is the perfect fulfillment of the prophecy, how could they be able to obey the divine command of Jesus Christ that those who read it, let him understand? While in reality, the understanding had not been given to them. Are they be held responsible to understand the book of Daniel? While such understanding cometh from God, and God did not bestow to them such understanding? Remember, in 2 TG number 7, Page 3, it says, Daniel was told to shut and seal the book even to the time of the end. The book, therefore, was not for the understanding of the people before the time of the end. When, when does the time of the end begin? 1844, right? That is very plain, brothers and sisters, in the old symbolic code. It says in the old symbolic code, 3 symbolic code, 8 to 10, page 8, it says the time must have, it says, if we must declare began to be open um, in more specific terms that is in the year 1844. Three symbolic code 8 to 10 page 8. Therefore, the people living prior to 1844, they have no understanding concerning the book of Daniel. And that is why here in 2SR page 27 and 28, this is the statement given by the voice of inspiration. A large portion of Christendom 
agree that we are living in the last days of this world history when Jesus was asked by his disciples for the signs of his return to earth again and of the end of the world. One of the many signs he gave was, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, who should read it, let him understand. Matthew 24 verse 15 It is evident from the words of the Master that the book of Daniel contains information regarding the signs of the times and the end of the world. The prophecies of Daniel were of little worth to the disciples and the early Christian church. For Daniel says the book was sealed to the time of the end. You see, it has a little worth to the early Christian church, to the apostolic church, and to the epistles. It has little worth. Therefore, the epistles could not be benefited by the book of Daniel. And the one that had fallen in 538 AD is the Ephesus. Therefore, it could not be the perfect fulfillment. And we know that according to track number 3, page 39, that the daily and the sanctuary had been thrown underfoot. On the second stage, ecclesiastical Rome, and also in the last stage, which is the Protestant period. Track number 3, page 39, as the he goat represented is the statement. And Alonso Jones Use the term instead of Protestant period, he uses the term American Rome. Now, what is the second reason, brothers and sisters? I would like to emphasize first. Let us connect our subject to the temple's type. We already studied several times that according to the Shepherd's Rod in 2SR, that if type destroyed type, so anti-type must destroy anti-type. 2SR page 271. As type destroyed type, so anti-type must have destroyed anti-type. Or in other words, that statement is plainly telling us that if there are two literal typical temples that were destroyed, there must also be two anti-typical temples to be destroyed. Why is it that in 1844, Revelation 14 verse 8 could not be the perfect fulfillment as stated in Great Controversy 390? The other reason is that Revelation 14 verse 8 must be applied to the temple. In Lutherans, Presbyterian, Methodists, and Baptists, these four great denominations by which the message of the second angel are intended to these four great denominations, all of them are not called as temple. According to the shepherd's rod, right? In 2SR page 268. Let's read. 2SR 268. The foregoing explanation answers one of our questions. The Protestant churches which were raised up before the woman returned from the wilderness were in total darkness concerning the sanctuary service. Therefore, they are not represented by the woman or by the temple. 2SR 268. They can be represented by the woman or the temple. Brothers and sisters. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It is very plain. The subject there is temple. But how about in 538 AD? Why is it that it is partial fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians? The second, or there are two prominent reasons. First, it is illogical that Ephesus is the focal point of the book of Daniel by which Jesus Christ definitely declared that to the people by which this vision is directed to them, the divine command, who should read it, let him understand. Then, how could it be that if that people are the epistles, the book of Daniel is little worth of them, according to 2SR 27 and 28, because they have little understanding or no understanding at all, because the book was still sealed in their time. And the second reason is that in 538 AD, yes, it is the temple that had been fallen in 538 AD, but the fact is, Revelation 14.8 had not been proclaimed in 538 AD. How about in 1844? Yes, Revelation 14.8 had been proclaimed, but 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 had not been proclaimed. Why? Because the message of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is pertaining to the temple. But the movements that had been fallen in 1844, it never been called as temple according to 2 SR page 268. Lutherans, Presbyterian, Methodist, and Baptist. Or in other words, to have a short summary, brothers and sisters, it can be easily understood. First, the statement in the Bible according to 2SR 191, Revelation 4 verse 1, the word hereafter is pointing to 1844. Therefore, the, the book of Revelation must be directed to the people living from 1844 onwards. But the generation in 1844 onwards is divided only into two classes. The period of the judgment that pertains to the dead and the period of the judgment that pertains to the living. But the voice of inspiration says in the general conference special page 39, 
saying the more we consider the subject, the more obvious becomes that the third angel's message in its final phase is the judgment for the living. John Conference Special, page 39 and page 40. And if you will go to John Conference Special, page 39, it says, In fact, the three angels' messages is applied in the judgment for the dead only indirectly, but the direct application is in the judgment for the living. So the time of the end is divided into two sections. The time of the end in the period of the judgment that pertains to the dead, and the time of the end in the period of the judgment that pertains to the living. And the statement in 2 TG 12, 30, saying, Moreover, the revelation is to be more fully understood during the judgment of the living, plainly indicating that the mere fact that the entire book of Daniel and the entire book of Revelation will be completely unfolded in the period of the judgment of the living, the focal point of the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation must be the last generation of men, the men who will no longer to taste that. And that is the reason that God unfolded the entire book of Daniel and the entire book of Revelation unto them so that they could be able to understand, brothers and sisters, all the deceptions of the devil and they have an opportunity to escape them. Now, I would like to read again this statement. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And let us read it says, No one can attentively read these two passages of scripture concerning Rome in the 8th chapter and in the 7th chapter of Daniel and compare them with the passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I would like to read again, brothers and sisters. So let us read. That is April 10, 1900 by Alonso T. Jones, Advent Review, Sabbath Herald, page 232, paragraph 11. It says, No one can attentively read these two passages of Scripture concerning Rome in the 8th chapter and in the 7th chapter of Daniel and compare them with the passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 without being able to see plainly that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 refers definitely to these passages in Daniel. And this makes it certain that it was these passages of Daniel from which Paul reasoned when he was at Thessalonica, when he reasoned with them out of the scriptures and told them in words that which later he wrote in the passage here quoted from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, as to the man of sin, the son of perdition, the mystery of iniquity, and that wicked. But the shepherd's rod is even more clearer that the man of sin on the first place in reality is applied to Lucifer, the man in heaven. You remember the statement in 2 TG number 28? It says here, 2 TG number 28 on page, let's read the statement. On page 13, we understand that Satan's name before his sin was Lucifer, and that he sinned before Eve sinned, that he was impersonated in the serpent that deceived Eve. We shall therefore consider the sin in heaven before we further consider sin on earth. Satan, we are told, was not the only sinner in heaven, but for with him were cast out of heaven a third of the angelic host. Revelation 12 verse 4. These were cast out of heaven because they gave heed to the words of Lucifer, to a man in heaven, rather than giving heed to the word of God. This was the angel's downfall. Lucifer himself fell when he aspired to be as God. So Lucifer is the man in heaven, the man of sin. 2 TG 28, page 13. And also, Sister White made it so plain that the prophecy in 2 Thessalonians is attached to Ezekiel 28. Now let us read here in 4 BC 11.62, a general movement represented. I ask our people to study the 28th chapter of Ezekiel. The representation here made, while it refers primarily to Lucifer, the fallen angel, has yet a broader significance, not one being, but a general movement. You see, a general movement is described and one that we shall witness. A faithful study of this chapter should lead those who are seeking for truth to walk in all the light that God has given to His people, lest they be deceived by the deceptions of these last days. And it says, Ezekiel 2 verse, Ezekiel 28 verse 2 and verse 6 to 10, soon to be fulfilled. And then attached, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7 and 8, then Ezekiel 28 verse 2, 6 to 10. The time is past approaching when this scripture will be fulfilled. So it is still unfulfilled. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and also Ezekiel 28. The world and the professedly Protestant churches are in this hour 
they taking sides with the man of sin. The great issue that is coming will be on the seventh day Sabbath. So the great issue is concerning the seventh day Sabbath or the Sabbath of the Lord, brothers and sisters. Now, let's read again a statement here in Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection from three pages 96 to 98. And now let us consider further the scripture expression in Daniel 8 concerning this little horn power. In verses 11 and 25 of this little horn power, it is said, He shall magnify himself in his heart. He magnified himself even to or against the prince of the host. And he shall also stand up against or reign in opposition to the princes, to the prince of princes. This is explained in 2 Thessalonians, second chapter, where the apostle, in correcting wrong impressions which the Thessalonians had received concerning the immediate coming of the Lord, says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposed it and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worship. So that he as God seated in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not, that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Brethren, to repeat again, the main subject in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is the temple. And in 1844, there was no temple that was fallen. Because the one that had been fallen is Lutherans, Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist. In 2SR 268, this four great denomination can never be called temple. The first antitypical temple, the Ephesus, it was fallen in 538 AD. But 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, brothers and sisters, is only partially fulfilled because at that time, Revelation 14 verse 8 is not attached. Because in Great Controversy 390, the perfect fulfillment to 2 Thessalonians, it must be in the time when there is a temple that was fallen and also at the time when Revelation 14 verse 8 must be proclaimed. And that is why the Spirit Prophecy says Revelation 14 8 is still future in 1844. Why? Because there was no 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 on the Dark Ages, it is only partially fulfilled. Why? Because there was no proclamation of Revelation 14 verse 8. And secondly, it is illogical that the focal point is the Ephesus because they have no understanding concerning the book of Daniel. Therefore, the focal point must be from 1844 onward, the period of the Laodicean Church. And brothers and sisters, the shepherds run the writings of Alonso Jones and also of Ellen G. White. Brothers and sisters, concerning Daniel chapter 8, it must be fulfilled in the Christian era, not in the Old Testament. And we will prove that in our next episode. And concerning the churches in the New Testament, the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, only two of them are called as temple. And that is the first candlestick, the Ephesus. And the last candlestick, the Laodicean. Now think it thoroughly. The voice of inspiration says, if there are two literal typical temples that was destroyed, there must also be two antitypical temples to be destroyed. And we will continue that subject, brothers and sisters, in our next episode. And hoping that the good Lord will bless us and will help us. Thank you very much for listening and viewing this program. May the good Lord bless you and have a wonderful evening.